So good afternoon, everybody. It's a big pleasure to be here in person speaking on behalf of subproject uh, 09. The title of the talk is actually the title of the subproject, namely Machine Learning Method for Structure Prediction of Multi-Component Perovskites. But this being a kick-off meeting, I, think I owe the audience a little more context, especially because part of that audience might now or in the future be watching us on YouTube, lecture tube, or tubes of a similar nature. So I will start by introducing the team and the goals of the subproject. So subproject nine is headquarters at the Institute of Materials Chemistry of Teuving, specifically at the group of theoretical materials chemistry led by Georg Martin, and we are now four people working directly on the project, two of those hired specifically under TACO. And those are our two very talented PhD students, Florian and Ralph, who are both here. And we also have the absolute best project number because nobody else can do this joke with the best bad movie of all time. So that as it may, in the project proposal, we formulated two questions in this framework where we set out to study complex oxides together. The first one is, what do oxide surfaces look like? And this is uh, connected with what Professor Hama has so brilliantly illustrated in his presentation. So uh, crystalline structures are a combination of problems in themselves, and when the, uh, their perfect translational symmetry is broken by the interaction of a surface, that complexity just explodes. In the direction parallel to the surface, we have the phenomenon of reconstruction with periodicities that are lower than that of the bulk solid. And in the direction perpendicular to the surface, well, we have uh, diffusion, atomic deformations, uh, and that's not even talking about the different stoichiometries. So, Doing a brute force exploration of that enormous landscape is just unrealistic. And the best we can do is to apply heuristics. A broad category of those are the so-called evolutionary algorithms, and although they have been explained much better than I could do, just to offer a bird's eye view, uh, the key consideration there is balancing exploration with exploitation, that is, discovering new promising areas of that phase space with creating more detailed maps of those. And the way they work, very generally speaking, is by keeping an ensemble, a sample, or a swarm of configurations and making that evolve uh, over iterations. They do that by combining transformations that spread the ensemble over space with other that push uh, particular members of that ensemble to promising points of set phase space, as you can see in this small animation. But to apply this kind of method, we still need to be able to compute the fitness, that is the, the energy in general, individual configurations. The second question we formulated in the project is more experimental in the sense in that it tries to see whether one can teach a machine learning model to recognize a stable oxide structure without actually knowing anything about the physics of the problem, just the atomic arrangement um, of, the, of the structure, in this case for bulk structures. We plan to develop this for the category of perovskites, and that is because uh, known descriptors of stability are already there, both very classical ones and more advanced ones from recent proposals. On the surface, this is just a classification problem, so nothing special from the point of view of machine learning, but it's a problem where we have very few um, training data in the context of the enormous quantity of possible configurations. In a class of models that's been shown to work very well in this context are generative adversarial models pioneered by the gentleman you see here, Ian Goodfellow. So a generative adversarial model is actually composed of two neural networks, the generator and the discriminator. Here the discriminator is the actual classifier. It's supposed to take an uh, oxide structure, adopting now the language of our particular problem, and return true or false, real or fake, depending on whether it belongs to that category we are looking for or not. On the other hand, the generator trains to be better and better and as good as possible at fooling the discriminator into thinking the structures it's making up are actually real. So a very important thing about this is that once the whole model has been trained to our satisfaction, we don't just dispose of the generator. This is actually the most important and interesting part of the problem because a fully trained generator is basically a deconstruction of the thing we are trying to generate, in this case, the stable perovskites onto a space of uh, a few latent variables. So it's something that we can use to integrate with other kind of machine learning models too. And this has been applied to, well, to in many fields, but specifically to something as complex as human faces. 
with the well-known model style gang. And in fact, this is not Ian Goodfellow, as I have tried to fool you into thinking. This is literally the first random face that I got when I went to this URL offering an interface into style gang. Anyway, so uh, in this first months after the approval of TACO, we have focused on the first question, and now I'm going to present a small project report. And since theoreticians are known to have a certain fetish for methods, and I'm admittedly the worst of the words in that regard, I think I would um, cover that part first and then have more time to focus on the applications. So as detailed in the proposal, the particular evolutionary algorithm we have chosen is the so-called covariance matrix adaptation evolution strategy, or CMA for short. And we based um, our methods on an open source implementation that has been developed by a former group, uh, member of our group, Marco Arigoni, with a focus on uh, point defects in solids. I think the analogies between the two uh, problems are clear. Basically, a breakdown of translation symmetry with the introduction of a defect, and also the vast um, phase space for reconstruction um, that is there. The way the CMA works is by keeping an ensemble of individuals whose size scales favorably with the size, uh, with the number of dimensions of the problem, uh, that are drawn from a multidimensional Gaussian distribution. And then it makes the mean vector and the covariance matrix of that Gaussian evolve over the iterations. A good aspect of the CMA is that it requires relatively few uh, parameters. It has to, you have to tweak relatively few knobs. You essentially need an initial configuration or founder. You need a step size that comes in the form of a prefactor for that covariance matrix. You need to decide the number of individuals you want per generation, but you can also let the code estimate those. And of course, you need a way to delimit the path of space that the perturbation can affect, which for point defects is a cutoff radius. This has been shown to work well for things like the stoichiometric vacancies in silicon, or for this, um, um, sorry, the stoichiometric defects in silicon, or for this neutral vacancy in uh, titanium dioxide, but it wasn't quite ready to work for this particular project. Firstly, Klinamen was essentially a sequential problem. Uh, the way it worked was by considering the configurations in each generation one by one, running on a, a multi-core node, and then letting VASP do the job, and in particular take care of the parallelization. This works well because the parallel performance of VASP is fantastic, but we wanted to scale uh, beyond that simple picture, and even use other calculators and other consumers of atomic configurations that are not strictly calculators. So the, the member of TACO in charge of this, Ralph, has spent some time completely restructuring the program to put a PostgreSQL database at the center of the operation now. Now, the CleanAmen controller runs on one node, generates structures, puts them in that database, and then spans calculators that can have any backend and run in principle anywhere, return the results through the database, and so on. And of course, he has also invested time in making the whole workflow much more robust to make this diverse picture possible. He also had to redefine the way the region of space affected by the defect is defined. It used to be a sphere. Now it's basically the whole slab geometry used to simulate the surfaces, except for the deepest layers that are kept fixed. And regarding the backends, well, of course, VAS is still supported, but we are now using mainly a new GPO based calculator that uses linear combinations of atomic orbitals as the basis set. Speedwise, this is very advantageous because we are not using basis functions to describe the empty space, but of course it comes at the cost of precision. So the evolutionary algorithm takes care of part of the uh, reducing the number of calculations, but a DFT calculation for a surface, even with a small basis set, is still expensive. So there's an obvious opportunity to use a surrogate model, as has already been explained, and to do that we have interface cleanamen with a neural network potential that we had originally implemented for ionic liquids called Neuralil. The template followed by Neuralil is extremely well established by now. It resembles the, the Parine developer Parinello template a lot. So uh, it calculates a contribution to the energy for each atom, and those are calculated based on uh, local atomic descriptors calculated around that atom. But precisely because of that, we also had the benefit of hindsight. So we tried to make use of uh, recent developments in uh, machine learning, and in that sense, our implementation deviates from many you can find in the literature in important details that have a measurable impact, all of them. For instance, we don't, didn't want to be limited to the number of layers we could use in the neural network, just because the training process gets stuck, something that happens 
quite often. And then we solve by using a next generation uh, activation function that completely avoids the vanishing gradients problem in combination with the so-called layer normalization that keeps the values of the intermediate signals between layers in an optimal range. We didn't want to get caught in, uh, swallow, um, in shallow local minima or to uh, fall into overfitting either. And for that, it was extremely helpful to use the so-called one cycle training schedule that varies the learning rate across orders of magnitude in each epoch. But the most important distinctive feature of this implementation is that it's built on top of the axe. This is a Google-sponsored framework that lets us keep the flexibility and quick prototyping of a high-level language, Python without sacrificing performance. And not only that, but everything that's implemented on top of YAX is automatically differentiable. That means that the functions expressed therein have derivatives that can be computed efficiently down to machine precision. And since we never have to implement those derivatives by hand, we get the same benefits for any new module that we add to the code. Now, to be frank, this wasn't strictly true in the first iterations of Neuralil because we used TensorFlow for the neural network part itself, and there were some complexities at the interface between that and the descriptor generation. But now we have ported it to Google Flux, a uh, next generation uh, framework that is being pushed by Google as a replacement for TensorFlow, and now everything is completely seamless. Actually, this port was already done under TACO, although it benefited the uh, ionic liquid results as well. The same can be said for the use of the one cycle training schedule and for a change in the loss function that handles outliers better. But we have also done work that was specific uh, to either the interface with clinamen or surfaces. For instance, a better treatment of periodic and some periodic systems, important for obvious reasons here, and also better parallelization over CPUs because the initial version of the code was very much targeted to GPUs. And finally, we have implemented a couple of more advanced modules um, with a view to using them for time in the future. One of them is a long-range uh, Coulomb interaction with charge equilibration, very much in the line of what Bella and co-workers have proposed with their fourth generation neural networks potential. The other is, um, well, using the automatic differentiation facilities to calculate matter and heat flux in a quick way with a view to study diffusion and thermal transport in the future as well. So now, with the methods behind us, I'd like to speak about the applications. And the first thing I want to say is a big thank you to Subproject2, uh, who have been our guide when choosing the, um, the, the, the most interesting um, problems to tackle. And their experience and expertise has been uh, extremely helpful here. So the first system we have chosen is the 110 uh, surface reconstruction of strontium titanate. So if we transverse this crystal in that direction, we cross alternating cationic and anionic layers. So if we cliff the bulk solid, for instance, so that the last layer is uh, cationic, we end up with a potentially very unstable structure. But that can, that can be compensated with the addition of titanium oxide units that have a negative charge. And by doing so, one ends up with a very interesting slew of uh, possible reconstructions we thought was a fantastic benchmark for the combination of the neural network with the evolutionary algorithm. So again, um, Ralph prepared a slab model for a four times one chunk of this structure and then used Klinamen with the DFT backend to run three different uh, optimization uh, sequences, ending up with 33,000 configurations and the associated DFT results that he then supported. And he got 5,000 for the training, no, 3,000 for the training, sorry, 500 more for validation during training, selecting hyperparameters and so on, and 5,000 uh, more for testing after training had been completed. And the results over that test set are very good. The errors in the energies are always in the order of one milli electron volt per atom. The errors in the forces are well below 100 milli electron volt per Armstrong. There are no clear outliers here, and there are no signs of overfit either. But more importantly, we actually put to the task of finding the reconstruction, this works. Starting with a founder that where the titanium oxide units has just been placed at halfway reasonable sites, we end up with a relaxed result that is in the right attraction basing of the known reconstruction. So we just need to run a local minimizer, a regular one, to obtain the known reconstruction. More interestingly still, when we apply that same combination of factors to a five times one slab that is 
never seen because it has been trained on a four times one slab. And starting from the very same founder, just going uh, along two different random paths, we arrive at two different known reconstructions, one with a 12 ring and a 6 ring, and one with a 10 ring and an 8 ring. They even appear in the right energetic order. So if we run them through GIPO or even through VASP as the final and most stringent test, uh, the, the energy difference between them keeps the same sign. So encouraged by these results, we are now also setting up uh, everything to explore this particular hematite structure. Um, well, apart from its intrinsic scientific interest and from some uh, Abinitio interfaces that I will discuss next, there is a particular appeal in this to us. Namely, that uh, Michele, Florian, Haushofer and the rest think that the published model for this reconstruction is not correct and they have an idea of what the right one is, but we have all agreed that they are not telling us. So we have to come up with our own proposal and then we can compare. And Florian Buchner has... Um, has been setting up everything to generate the, the database of DFT calculations needed for this, and his first task has been to come up with a robust DFT workflow that can work for more or less arbitrary configurations. So spin polarized calculations of the kind needed to, the, to, to study these magnetic structures are notoriously more difficult to converge than non-spin polarized ones, and it really pays double and triple check that everything works before polluting the database with nonsense or having all the calculations fail. Of course, beyond that, there's also the question of whether one should use a Hubbard correction or just plain DFT for this. We are very pragmatic here. We are not looking for an a prioristic answer, neither in terms of structure nor in terms of energy. We plan to use both and come up with a richer catalog of structures that we can then test against the experiment. And now I'm going to introduce a third system, but I want to make it clear that this wasn't born under the umbrella of TACO. Actually, this was already underway uh, when TACO was granted. But it has the common denominator that it's a complex oxide, and more importantly, it has benefited from the methodological developments for TACO, and in turn, we have learned a lot from the results uh, to improve our methods. This is Hafnia oxide that it's being studied by another brilliant PhD student in our group, Sebastian Bichelmaya, with funding from Infinium. Obviously, the complexity does not come from the chemical formula, which is pretty simple, but from the very large number of different phases that have been described under different conditions. So what Infinium would like to have here is a way to study the effect of subtle things like doping or nanostructuring um, in a predictive way. But the first step is to have a, a robust description of all these bulk phases. And this slide deals with the part of the project that predates TACO. The central idea here is that, uh, well, thanks to the gibbs bogoliubov bob theorem, the minimum free energy that we can obtain using a harmonic ansatz to study the probability density in real space for atomic displacements is an upper bound of the actual free energy of the system. And based on that, we can obtain an effective harmonic potential for each phase with each combination of lattice parameters and uh, at each step. And based on that uh, eff effective potential, we can then apply this analytic formula for the free energy. This resembles the well-known quasi-harmonic approximation, but it's actually a very different beast, not only because this is not an actual vibrational spectrum, but also because of this correction term that replaces the thermal average of the harmonic potential energy with the thermal average of the actual potential energy. So we use a couple of tricks. Uh, when sampling to try and extract as much information as possible from each uh, DFT configuration. And this seems uh, to work very well when compared with experiment for things like the thermal expansion coefficient of the cubic phase or the temperature dependent lattice parameters of the tetragonal phase and all of that at a fraction of the cost of, for instance, an Abinitio molecular dynamics run. But of course, there's a clear opening here for a surrogate model as well to accelerate all of this. The key, uh, key, the, the key word here being transferability. So should we train a different neural network for each phase? Should we train a neural network for all phases using information from all phases? Can we use a subset of phases to train a neural network that can be applied to all of them? Well, the easy answer here is that no machine learning model can work well for things it has never seen, but there's more to it than that. Because remember that the actual input to these neural networks are those uh, local atomic uh, descriptors. And the level of overlap between those for different phases is far from trivial, especially when atomic displacement and changes in the unit cell itself are involved. 
right? And there's an even more fundamental aspect to this, which is the trade-off between bias and variance in all machine learning models. So for each model, we can choose whether to describe the training set extremely well, but have the parameters change a lot when the training set is changed, or have more generalized generalization power at the cost of some uh, precision in the description of the training set. Well, our, our neural network in particular contains measures to prevent overfitting. This doesn't mean that this is the best choice everywhere, but in this case it should be. And one of those is this one cycle training schedule. And when put to the test, it seems to generalize quite well. Here I'm showing the result for three different neural networks that have been trained on cubic data only, on tetragonal data only, and on monoclinic data only. And all of them are then applied to the tetragonal configurations, and all of them work reasonably well. All of them fall in the same ballpark as the data for strontium titan that I showed uh, before. Of course, we encode some degradation of the performance when uh, data for the tetragonal phase is not included, but these are still useful. So Sebastian has been working a lot, contributing things back to TACO, and now he's in a position to put all of this in use to explore the phase space of Hafnia further. And with this, I come to the last part of my presentation, in which I'm going to try and tell you what we are doing now and what we are going to do immediately. So there's a third line of methodological development through which we are trying to implement a linear scaling um, algorithm to calculate uh, EVAD-like sums, which uh, in short deal with Coulomb interactions and, and similar things. This is also in charge of Florian Buchner. And the method we have chosen is a so-called multi-level summation method. This is a purely real space method that combines a hierarchy of grids, a, hier a binary hierarchy, specifically with a decomposition of the Coulomb kernel, one over a, in a finite number of contributions. One of those takes the long range tail, another one is very short range and contains the one over r divergence, and all the others are both compactly supported and very smooth over the grid. Florian has already implemented and tested this for non-periodic systems, and now he's ready to extend it to periodic and sub-periodic ones, and uh, to integrate it with Klinamen in the future. We are also trying to continue and intensify our collaboration with some project too. And uh, that collaboration basically gravitates around Viperlit, the um, program to calculate and even uh, acquire low energy electron diffraction spectra. Here we have been working with uh, Michele and the rest of the team as well. We have set up a shared database server that you can actually see here that everybody can access. This is not only at the center of Klinamen, but also accessible for Viperlead and so on. And thank you, uh, and thanks to their patience, we have also been able to deploy Viperlead itself on our cluster. So now we are trying to uh, do several things here. One of them would be to see if we can use the LED spectrum as part of the fitness function for Klinamen. And even further, perhaps in some cases, it makes sense to use Klinamen instead of a grid search facilities and optimization um, out of Viperlit. And now we have identified which changes are necessary on both sides of this collaboration, and those are underway. And well, for strontium titanate, uh, we are ready to explore more sizes and more stoichiometries, but we also want to extend our work with ensembles of neural networks. Right now it's merely diagnostic. Uh, to go active learning, to apply ranking or weighting to be able to, to generalize better to regions that we have not explored yet. As I told you, for the hematite structure, um, we should be ready to run first uh, optimization sequences. Hafnia is about to enter the production phase uh, with result for all those new phases. And finally, we are going to um, hire a new person for the team to specifically work on those general if adversarial models and start experimenting with the first part. And with that, I come to the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. For those of you watching on YouTube, please don't forget to click on like and subscribe. And for the rest, well, I will be uh, happy to take any questions. Th thank you very much for your attention. Thank, th thank you very much, Jesus. Uh, the experiment is extremely keen to learn if you come up with the right solution without you give, getting the answer. So. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, any questions for Jesus? Everybody wants coffee, I think. <laughs> well, why, while people think about it, let me, let me ask you, you think you really, uh, so So one, one thing we have always been talking about is that just using, you know, the simply, relatively simple approximation of DFT are not good enough, right? So in, you already solved one thing for this anatase. Did you have to take into account these polaronic distortions there, and how did you do that? 
Well, I wasn't actually involved in that particular study, so I'm probably not the best uh, person to, to, to tell you the details about that. But I think the, the central idea of that publication was to introduce the method in a few illustrative applications without getting into the complexities of the DFT treatment, so not, not to compare a uh, particular choice of DFT parameterization with others. For the Hafnia, that's, uh, I'm not so sure and quite understood the question. I mean, obviously, if you develop a surrogate model, you would most likely like to train on all simultaneously. I mean, at least for Ziconia, which I think is very similar to Hafnia, we went along that line, and I don't think we even found that the quality for one specific material degrades if you actually include the other one. I mean, we haven't tested it, admittedly. But do you think this is an issue, that you need separate uh, neural networks for each phase to get uh, better precision? Or no, it's mostly I'm an confused. issue with the generation of the training data. Once we have good training data for a few phases, do we really need to generate a lot of training data for the rest? And uh, yeah, another facet of that problem is, of course, the intrinsic interest of checking whether one can generalize a local model like this to work for different phases. Yeah, I mean, we did the Zirconia, so we just published that. Mm -hmm. That looks actually pretty great, so we should probably... I think there was no fundamental problem in training mm -hmm. on all phases simultaneously, and I don't think it's too different from what you are doing. So, yeah, I, I would be rather optimistic that this does work, okay. yeah, I think. Hi. Uh, yeah, about the hematite, actually, I was going to ask over coffee, but I guess I can also do now. Um, so there is this general problem, right, that, that with VASP quite often, or, or generally with DST, I guess, um, it, it's difficult to get a, just get the energy based on whatever input you give it because the magnetization doesn't um, stay stable and, and kind of... Um, well, that's yeah. part of the idea here. Yeah, it actually has two sides to the question, right? So yeah. should you... Uh, aim to describe one magnetization correctly, or should you um, try to optimize that? Right, because the, the latter can be uh, more complex, uh, specifically in the context of an optimization algorithm. We would need to include that as a separate parameter there. But um, staying with the most uh, simple interpretation of the question, which is getting a particular configuration with uh, to converge. That is basically what Florian, I mean the other Florian, uh, has been doing uh, so far in, in this project. And uh, well, we are now relatively confident that we have uh, a robust uh, workflow there. Of course, there are a couple of classical tricks to initialize in those magnetic moments, like using uh, higher values than you would expect the relaxed ones to be. Uh, and in, in the context of the descriptor um, picture, you also <coughs> need to make sure that you can identify each atom correctly in the displaced configuration and so on, but in principle everything is sorted out. out. Yeah. Then one more question. You know that uh, Jörg Bela has recently published uh, a work where he actually tried for manganese, uh, yep. manganese oxide, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, do you believe you need uh, these kind of local magnetic environment descriptors as well? Well, what is I your feeling here? Because this I am not completely sure, and actually this is one of the discussions that we had when preparing, when preparing this, um, this presentation, whether we should touch on that. Yeah. Um, so I don't think, I mean, the last word has been said on that. I don't think this model will be the final one because he's still using a surrogate icing model that probably does not work too well sure. with displaced uh, position. It's, of course, an interesting first step. But maybe in the future we will also try, just as a fun experiment, to include that in the descriptor in a similar way that he does. Uh, one advantage of this structure is that instead of resorting to weights when building the, the local descriptors, we are using a general embedding sublayer. So right now the inputs to this are just the atomic species, pre-run of the mill there, but it's pretty easy to have more inputs and more embedding coefficients, and one of those could perfectly well be the, the magnetic model of the neighbors without uh, well, losing any other of the, of the features of the code. It should be relatively simple to try out. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's actually, I agree, it's even not clear because in some previous work, he didn't require this kind mm -hmm. of local environment, magnetic environment, okay. Yeah. So in principle, our idea is to go without them, but maybe in the future, we can try them out. So with, there's no further questions. Let's thank both Jesus and Björk for nice talks. <laughs>